Hey guys, welcome to Thrive Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for listening on. You could have been anywhere in the world and you decided to spend just a few moments of your precious time and we greatly appreciate it. Here on the podcast, we talk about three things, living a plant-powered lifestyle and enhancing emotional resilience and creating a thriving mindset. And I interview a range of passionate guests such as physicians, dietitians, coaches, entrepreneurs, and many more. And please join me as I deliver these engaging, informative, and high-valued conversations for you. And just remember the first five seasons of the Thrive Bites podcast can now be found in the new The Chef Doc app, available in your Apple Store and Google Play stores. So what are you waiting for? Come on inside. Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Dr. Colin Zhu, and uh, we have a great Uh, next episode for you guys. We are going to be talking with Dr. Sweta Chakraborty, and we are talking everything about what affects us just by living on planet Earth. And we talk everything from climate change to behavioral science to what is it that we perceive in our own worlds and what is actually happening and what is actually reality. So you don't want to miss this and I'll see you guys inside. Okay, guys, well, welcome to another episode of the Fry Bites podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us. You could have been anywhere in the world and you decided to share your precious moments with there with us today, and we greatly appreciate it. Guys, we have a wonderful, wonderful guest uh, with us today. I'm happy to call her a friend and a good colleague, and she's doing it big for the planet, literally. <laughs> um, so her name is Dr. Uh, Swetha Chakra uh, She is a global recognized risk and behavior scientist and expert on global risk ranging from climate change to COVID-19. She is a trusted authority in this She's the CEO of We Don't Have Time in North America. And I'll have her go deeper into this. And she has been featured on TEDx, South by Southwest, featured speaker, and has been featured in many, many international news media outlets, including but not limited to CNN, the New York Times, the BBC, Forbes, Fox News Channel, Sky News, just to name a few. And uh, she's written extensively in many, many peer-reviewed journals. And she is just recently been promoted up to the Earthshot Prize as one of the expert advisory boards. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Sweta. Hi. (laughs) Thanks so much for having me, Colin. Thrilled to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with here on the show. The first time we met was actually in Brooklyn. Uh, not too long ago at the Vegan Women's Summit. And I was really, really blown away. Our conversation, uh, I've never heard of a climate behavioral scientist. So just to kind of get oriented for everyone, for my audience, um, I like to kind of you know, orient my audience in terms of the super heroine story. You know, how did we get from point A to point B? So if you can tell me, what were the key moments that led you to study and focus your career on climate behavioral science? Okay, so I love that question because you'd never heard of a climate behavioral scientist because literally it didn't exist. I kind of put those words together and I was like, let's see where this goes. And (laughs) it's been received relatively well. So up until I put climate in front of behavioral, I was a behavioral scientist. And that's a field. It's been around for decades at this point. It stemmed from psychology, really taking off in the 1970s. And the idea was to use what we knew in advances in social science, cognitive, and, and more specifically cognitive science and neuroscience, computer science, to understand the disconnect between how the public perceives risks or regular people like you and I perceive different risks that we face, right? From like getting on an airplane, getting in our car, food we put in our mouth, drugs we choose to take, where we choose to live, these different risks, all of these decisions come with different risks. And how do we perceive them? But there's a disconnect between that and the actual risk, right? So we know what the base rate statistics are of getting on a plane, getting in a car, choosing somewhere to live that might get flooded because of hurricanes or storm surges. There's actual numbers associated that. But there is a massive disconnect between our brain's perception of that risk and the actual risk. And that's where I sit. I'm fascinated by that disconnect. And that is the field of behavioral science. So it really pulled from different 
aspects of psychology and computer science and statistics and economics. And it created this field, which has been studied now for decades and across multiple academic centers in the United States and around the world. And I've had the privilege to study at some of some of the great ones with some incredible professors and academics that are really leading the this, this field. So my career started at Carnegie Mellon. I went to the UK. I studied at Oxford. I studied at King's College London. I studied at LSC. I kind of did like a little tour of the UK schools. Uh-huh. And I came back to the States and back to Columbia University where I taught behavioral science. And I was teaching the field, right? I was teaching the kind of literature the that, that makes up the field of behavioral science and wondering where to apply it to make the most impact. And up until I got back to New York, I'd been applying it to different health-related issues. You'll appreciate this as a doctor, right? So how do we think about engaging with doctors? Why do we not necessarily listen to doctors' instructions? This concept of non-compliance to to, um, instructions by our doctors on what medicines to take or lifestyle changes to make, which you would say is non-adherence, right? But non-adherence, non-compliance. That was actually my doctorate, studying the role of trust in patient non-compliance. So what were the different cognitive triggers that were resulting in a disconnect in perception of risk between what we know is a safe decision potentially to take a drug versus a patient saying that this is a risky thing to do, I'm not going to do it. So I started applying behavioral science in my career to health and to patient outcomes. And it wasn't until I got to New York that I was asked to teach a course on behavioral science and carbon sequestration, looking at risks around different technologies to sequester carbon from the atmosphere so as to address the impact of climate change, right? To address that the planet is warming and we know that carbon is the main reason that the planet is warming up. Once I started teaching this class, and I didn't know anything about climate, honestly, (laughs) I learned from my students. I had a lot of those that were coming to take this class as practitioners in the field of climate, but they wanted to understand how behavioral science could be helpful to their work and how they could apply behavioral science to advance what they were trying to do. So I learned from my students that the application of behavioral science to climate was just uh, untapped. And there was such a need for it because once you learn about the reality of the planet warming, I mean, that's it. There's no going back. It it feels to me at this point, and I think given where we are, that we're just past the hottest year in recorded history in human history, right? 2023. I think a lot more people will begin to agree with this, but everything kind of stems back to the planet warming. We have increased infectious disease outbreaks. We have increased issues around food access. We have increased violence. We have increased migrations of people. We have increased conflict. I mean, everything really comes back to the, we are in a different environment from which we've ever really existed as a human species. So for me, I had to apply behavioral science to addressing the climate crisis. So long answer to your question, but that's how I got (laughs) No, no, I love it because I think that it's kind of fueled by urgency, right? Because I think a lot of um, people, and I'm sure you can, you know, agree is that, you know, we kind of live in our own bubbles, right? And when you don't have that connection between you and this far away disaster that's, you know, very, very far away, you don't have that connection. So it's not a quote unquote meet immediate threat, right? Our nervous systems are always in fight or flight because we just battle, you know, chronic stress, right? So the urgency, in my opinion, obviously, you know, you would understand, you know, you would know more is that, you know, if we can make that connection stronger or closer, and unfortunately, it's just demonstrated every single year from natural disasters, to like you said, the migrations and, you know, food access until it actually ends up in our backyard. And I don't want that to happen for people to make the change when people are going to be like, huh, you know, as opposed to, you know, being swayed in a different type of way on media, whether you have someone that's pro or against, you know, even believing that it's real or not. Oh my God. It's exactly that. I mean, this is why we haven't acted on this in decades. We've known the science since 1950s, right? <laughs> and it's like 80 years later and we're, we're just beginning to say we've got to, we've got to make sure that we act before 2030 now because the window is closing. Yeah. It's been closing for 80 years. So why, what, I mean, how, how is that the case that this is a major crisis that we've seen coming that scientists yeah. have put time and money into 
And even those that are the biggest perpetrators of this, which is the oil and gas or the dirty fossil fuel industry that's really behind this, they've even put time, money, research and resources into this. They've known for decades that this has been that this was going to happen, that burning fossil fuels was going to result in a global temperature increase that was going to have devastating impacts that we see in real time now as hurricanes, as droughts, as wildfires. So, I mean, we've known this. And despite knowing this, again, it's that perception of risk versus the base rate statistics, the real risk, the empirical evidence, all of that, that disconnect has prevented us from working. And that disconnect comes from what you just said, right? Perception, what drives perception? We respond and react to risks that are immediately in front of us, that are tangible, that have uh, catastrophic impacts, that impact little children, that impact uh, older populations. Those are the risks that the public demands action on and that policymakers act on because the public demands action on. So risks like climate, it's like the perfect invisible risk that doesn't have attention resources allocated to it because of all the points you just said. It's far away. It's perceived as far away. It's perceived as slow moving. Much of it is invincible. Think about one of the impacts of climate that is actually is is truly, truly devastating. If you think about um, what's what is projected to happen in the coming years, but sea level rise, right? See, we are mostly water on this planet. And because of global temperature increase, anticipating up to six feet in sea level rise by the end of this century, right? And that comes from melting glaciers, that comes from increased precipitation in the atmosphere because of the increased heat. And six feet of sea level rise means cities that we are very familiar with, that many of us live in, that those that are tuning in right now might be living in, might be currently watching us from, will not exist. These cities will not exist. First, it'll become annoying. It'll be flooded over and over again. And you're not going to get your mail. You're not going to get your ambulances. You're not going to get you know your fire trucks coming. But at some point, it's going to be submerged because that's what six feet of sea level rise means. But and and that seems you know that that seems like an Armageddon Day scenario, which is very visible. But right now, we can't imagine it, and that's the problem. Because again, it's perceived as really slow, really far in the future. And even though it's going to be super devastating, we still struggle as scientists and communicators to make it really clear to the public that this is coming, and we need to be smart and act now. Some of those cities that are most vulnerable. You would think telling them like Miami, okay, and I'm so sorry to those that are tuning in from Miami, but that's a good example (laughs) of a very popular city in the United States. I mean, telling residents of Miami to stop building, to stop, you know, investing in real estate, to move away from the coastline. It's it's such a Mm -hmm. difficult task. It's a really, really difficult task. But if we don't do it now, if we don't put plans in place, if we don't manage retreat and get communities on board and really figure out relocation and work with local governments and federal government, then we're going to, we are going to be walking right into a crisis that is, we know is coming. So this is the challenge. And this is the reason behavioral science exists is to close that gap between perception, reality, to use communication to close that gap and to ultimately better align the realities of the risks that we face with the policies, right? With the solutions, with, uh, with public support. So, so much to comment on this. Well, number one, I used to live in uh, New Orleans when I was working for uh, the veterans, the VA. And, uh, you know, they're just a, such a resilient community. And one of the probably, you know, uh, cities that probably will, and I don't want to say, but like will actually be submerged, right? As well as some parts of uh, let's see, Eastern uh, is where I read, like maybe like Virginia is what I read, that it's already getting waves, literal waves of being flooded. It's very real. And um, I've you know also humbled to actually have traveled to Antarctica myself and to be able to see and be able to be guided by scientists as part of the trips to say like, hey, you know, this used to be all one flat block of ice and now has actually been receded Right. I saw this in Iceland where it used to be just a whole you know, block of ice mm-hmm. and it's actually a lake now. Right. So you're actually seeing receding and we're, you're only seeing these in reports. Right. In scientific journals. Right. Sometimes it, it, it does come into the popular media. But like we're saying, it's not being it's having that huge you know, disconnect. Let's go back um, a little bit in terms of timeline, in terms of human history. 
has it always been this kind of gradual, slow pace inevitability? ability of, oh, you know, things are actually, you know, turning a cycle? Or was there a specific decade, would you say, uh, or point in time where it actually started to change, uh, change course? So I didn't actually mention this to you, but it's quite literally chapter two of a book I'm writing is kind of mapping out the history of how we got here. And really, what the role of burning fossil fuels has been in this whole process, because I knew it, I knew it broadly, but I'm actually even shocked looking at the actual original documents that have been have, that have been brought forward from investigators from Harvard University, from the Potsdam Institute. Those the researchers there have done analyses on the investigative reporting that came from that, uh, that came from reporters back in 2015 that began to uncover when where that tipping point was that really kind of took us from this being bad. And we needed to, we recognize that burning fossil fuels was warming that atmosphere to a getting to the point where we were like, wow, we really, this is, if we don't act on this now, we're going to absolutely regret it. So I would say the year is actually like 1988, if we want to put like an exact date on it. <laughs> oh, really? I would imagine it's a lot earlier than that. A lot earlier. We've, we've known since the 1950s that yeah. burning fossil fuels was going to warm the planet, right? That it was, it, it was inevitably going to increase uh, global temperature and the impacts of that were going to result in climate impacts, again, like we're seeing in real time now. But I would say since 1988, we have doubled the amount of carbon in our atmosphere prior to that year, doubled. So and it was it was like a pivotal year where carbon emissions just kind of exponentially increased. And the reason for that was the, <laughs> the fossil fuel industry doubled down rather than actually take the research coming internally and acting on it to transition away to renewable energy, to really recognize that it was the exploitation of the planet, the drilling and the burning of this dirty energy of oil, coal, and gas that was resulting in the global temperature increase and using that knowledge to really become uh, champions for the planet and saying, yes, we understand we still need energy, but this is not sustainable. Rather than that, they doubled down. So that was the year that that the fossil fuel industry really came up with a coalition, a what, what seemed like an environmental group coalition, but it was mm -hmm. actually a front for continued massive effort at maintaining business as usual through misinformation, disinformation mm -hmm. campaigns, and bringing in PR professionals and marketers to actually to not just hide. So uh, the companies themselves were hiding what they knew to be true. But then even more insidious than that is that they brought in these professionals to say the exact opposite of their own findings. So you have mm. scientists that are saying, OK, James Hansen, for example, famous scientist from NASA, right? One of the one of the original advocates for uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels. He was the one who was like, I mean, look at all the data. And this is coming from federal government funded studies that we really need to we really need to. Um, transition away. At that same time, you had the industry really dig in and say, they don't know what they're talking about. And it was the rise of climate denial. It was like, that was the moment. And because of that really concerted effort, we saw a doubling of carbon emissions into our atmosphere since 1988. So yes, we've known for a long time, but I would say the year that drives me the most crazy is that one. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. up until then, there was still some potential for the industry to do the right thing. But that was the moment that we realized that this really was this really was a example of greed at the expense of people on the planet. Mm -hmm. This sounds like um, the first word that comes to mind as you're describing this is greenwashing. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, in our world and in terms of health, when the uh, obesity epidemic started rising since the 70s. Uh, it's also called lean washing. And it's kind of like the CEO of Coca-Cola, you know, when the obesity epidemic was happening was saying that, oh, you know, this is not contributing from our products. You know, people are just not exercising enough. Right. right. Um, so it's that strong, deep pockets, strong, deep marketing campaigns to be really like, you, you know, like we're talking about, it's just perception, changing everyone's, you know, belief patterns to say like, oh, you know, so let's steer them away from the actual problem, right? Exactly. So in confusion, it, it's Big Tobacco's playbook. It was it was convincing people that it was their own fault for smoking cigarettes and bringing on cancer diagnoses. It, it's the same playbook of beverage industrialists that were blaming people for not recycling plastic 
right? And it was their fault. It was taking the onus of responsibility from the industry and its operations and putting it on the public in a way that is now making the public feel bad that they aren't doing enough to solve the climate crisis. Now, I am 100% an advocate for us recognizing our own impact on the planet, right? How we engage with the planet in terms of our daily decision making, what we eat, where we choose to live, all of that stuff. We are we are individuals that are empowered and we are able to make choices that are good for us, our families, our communities and the planet. I'm not take, I'm not saying that there isn't a behavioral widespread collective action that needs to happen, but <laughs> do, do not get it twisted. It was the industry that created the concept of carbon footprint. They love the idea of making people think that it was their own personal decisions and choices that was resulting in bad outcomes for planet Earth. This was the concept of carbon footprint came up with, and I, I love carbon footprint, by the way, like I'm all about it. I'm constantly tracking my carbon emissions and I'm constantly poking fun at my friends and colleagues to see like who's doing better, who's doing worse, right? So I think it's great to raise awareness. Kind of like a Fitbit, right? You, should, yeah. you, gotta, you gotta do one for, exactly. for a Fitbit version. <laughs> exactly, but the reason for that a carbon footprint is great is to raise awareness. And so to engage people at the planet in a way that we treat each other, we, we abide by the golden rule or we should. Right. People should be kind to one another, do unto others as you want uh, others to do unto you. So I like the idea of carbon footprint so that we engage with the planet in a similar way. Treat the planet well so that you have a sustainable environment in which you can you can excel. That's the benefit of the carbon footprint. But the carbon footprint came up, was brought to light in the early 2000s by Ogilvy. And it was commissioned by British Petroleum as a means to move the onus of responsibility to the public, basically to say, you know, what what are you doing and what is your contribution? Because ultimately we don't have the best choices, right? We would make better choices if we could, but the reality is, is we're in a few fossil fuel driven global economy. And so it's not as simple to switch out from dirty energy to clean energy as we would like. And so this really requires industry and multilateral efforts across countries, across uh, country delegations to work together to really make it easier for people to make better choices. I want you all to think about your carbon footprint and to engage with the planet in a better and more sustainable way. But don't forget the big picture. And that really is the fossil fuel industry needs to transition and governments need to put pressure on to see that happen. So let's talk about, you know, you said uh, big picture. So let's talk about in terms of industry sectors, right? Can you give us some like high level numbers in terms of Okay, what is contributing the most, right? Is it the transportation sector? Is it the food and agricultural sector, right? That's where my world comes in. And then out of that, you know, my understanding, let, let's just say we use fossil fuel and transportation as a as a, an example, you know, four or five of the westernized, you know, nations, I think US, England, China and India and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are one of the most, they contribute to like a majority mm -hmm. of the carbon uh, emissions. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, no, that's that's right. So transportation, especially in the US, is the, is the biggest contributor of carbon emissions, almost 30%. And some great resources here are our federal agency pages. They make it very clear. The Environmental Protection Agency, epa.gov, kind of breaks down all of the different sectors in the US and their contribution of carbon to the big picture problem. So it's transportation, it's food and ag, and it's electricity are the biggest perpetrators. So yeah, I'm sorry you're in there. But, <laughs> but, I, mean, well, I do my part. I do my part. So <laughs> yeah, but I mean, again, it's like the point of this is not to make people feel bad, right? The point of this is raising awareness, having people more seeing the invisible. Because what we're used to seeing as consumers of dirty energy is we come into our homes, we flip a light switch, the lights go on. We want that, we demand that, and we don't really question the source of how that's getting to us. But talking about this, having this podcast, having these conversations, putting as much of this out in mainstream media, social media, and you as an individual to your friends, to your networks, making this top of, of conversation makes the invisible visible. And as a behavioral scientist, for me, that's critical because it's step one what we know to be true in terms of actual outcomes and changes and, you know, actual to see, to see actions being taken. That's step one. Step mm -hmm. one is, is education awareness and communication, talking about it and having it, having it talked about in the same way we talk about sports or pop culture or, you mm -hmm. know, politics, 
we need to be talking about climate. We need to be talking about climate solutions. It's still in the single digits of conversation and coverage by mainstream media. So that can't be the case when this is quite literally the biggest risk that we face. As, as a planet <laughs> that all of us face, right? <laughs> it really can't be in the single digits of coverage, right? So this is, it's really important that we become aware, make the invisible visible and recognize that wait, our source of energy is not actually coming from sources that are renewable necessarily. And even that, no pun intended, you know, light being switched on in our brains <laughs> will actually go a long way in ultimately changing where the source of light comes from when you flick the switch when you walk into your home. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for hopping on to this week's episode. Guys, it's 2024. What is your intention for this year? Who do you want to become and how do you want to feel? Some of the things that you might be you know, looking to do is to lose weight. Some of you guys want to get out of your family history and genetics and not play victim to your medical and health destiny. Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, it's very, very important to kind of look at some facts and figures. For weight loss, 71% of Americans are overweight and 40% are considered and classified as obese. And these numbers are continuously rising. A lot of these are associated with a lot of medical issues, arthritis, gallstone issues, heart disease, cholesterol, diabetes, cancer, um, and the list goes on. And also having and carrying extra weight increases your risk for COVID. Also, you know, in terms of chronic disease, 60% of Americans carry one chronic disease, 40% two or more. Whenever I get a patient, it's usually a laundry list of medications that they are taking at the same time. Guys, if you are looking for a different and alternative solution, I've created a solution for you guys, and that's in the form of group coaching. If you want to be coached by us, Dr. Zhu, and our team members, um, me and my team, I've set up a beautiful, beautiful 12-week, three-month program that's going to be led by your own respective group coach, also led by me, me teaching you expert classes, and we teach you on what to eat, how to shop, what recipes to go for, where to navigate the supermarket, your pantry, your kitchen, and learning all about sustainable strategies on losing weight and preventing chronic disease. So if you want to learn more, click on the link below, and we would love to set up a breakthrough call with you guys to see if we are a mutual fit. And I want to be able to cheerlead and advocate you guys and be a support for your wellness journey. So click on the link, schedule a call. We'll see you guys on the next one and enjoy the rest of this episode. Yeah. I am curious though, because we've been having this, you know, electric vehicle, you know, revolution and it's, you know, mm, I probably say a decade, maybe a decade and a half, you know, you, you know, let me know if I'm, you know, uh, if I'm accurate or not, is it any better or do you feel, because you have a lot of issues with hearing about mining and where it's mined and all that, and then different minerals that's extracted from the, the earth. Is it any better, would you say, or, you know, or is it just like a lesser of two evils? Oh, you bring up so much stuff right now. This is all very current. It's it's super current. There's a great resource for your watchers for of this show will be Climate Nexus as well. Uh, they cover transportation as like an actual daily kind of deep dive into the sector and where it's going. And so it's the one that you can actually track and watch best because mm -hmm. it's it's one of the most ambitious transitional sectors to clean energy. So Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which was this unprecedented multi-billion dollar infusion of federal funds into transitioning away from dirty energy to clean energy really emphasized transportation and the electrification of transport in the United States. And the goal was to reach it, to reach um, net neutral in transportation by 2030. So 20 years ahead of where all of the other sectors are aiming for, which is more mid-century. And so Transportation has gotten a lot of funding, a lot of support. It is moving in the right direction, absolutely. Will it happen in by the by the dates that have been set by the government, by Biden, and by so many other so many other um, players in this space? That has yet to be seen. And yes, there are consequences of you know building batteries for electric cars because that mm. requires mining. And and we just saw 
And uh, at the risk of this being evergreen, we just saw Norway, the country of Norway, pass a a plan to mine into the Arctic to mm. uncover critical minerals that are part of that are necessary for batter, for electric batteries. And so that's the trade off, right? <laughs> that's the trade off because <laughs> we need electric cars, but now we're we're doing deep sea mining. To yeah, minerals to build the batteries for these electric cars. So I think need- it goes back to like economics 101. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? There's yeah. always a trade off, always a cost of something, right? Yeah. So if you're if in the ideal situation, you're lessening, you know, fossil fuels, then you're increasing, you know, all these other types of natural resources. And it's kind of like, you know, where, where do you where do you put your, you know, investments in? In terms of the general layperson, right? And the general public, the general consumer, you have mentioned about awareness, right? Are there any other low hanging fruit, quote unquote, strategies to help from an individual basis to kind of contribute to reversing this trajectory? I really want people to understand, first of all, to release guilt, right? Because there's this, the, the, the fossil fuel industry campaigns making your decisions and, and you know, to feeling bad about just living your life getting from point A to point B, buying certain foods and deciding where to choose to live and all of those decisions that humans make. I need people to recognize that it's not, the onus of responsibility isn't on them, that ultimately we can release the guilt that we carry with us, that it's our fault in some way. And once, let's say we have guilt, many people don't even have guilt, but let's say we have guilt, turning that guilt into something adaptive. So Adaptative guilt is actually a very strong motivator for action, right? So if you're feeling bad about about not doing enough or or every decision increasing your carbon emissions, use that guilt to propel yourself to take action to to really recognize that you can you have power as a communicator. Because again, as I was saying before, that's step one. So just talk about it. It sounds really simple, but actually that will go a long way as an individual. Mm -hmm talking about these things with your friends, with your family, with your networks, really begins to close that gap between risk perception, what I was saying in the beginning, we know we get wrong, and risk reality, right? So communicate and radically confront why you might not be worried about something that we know is an issue like sea level rise, right? Like flooding, like the potential Mm -hmm. for storm surges and future hurricanes. So my answer to your question is step one is stop feeling bad, release your guilt, if you have any, use that adaptative guilt to really move towards communicating, to talking, to conversing on it. And then having those conversations will naturally allow you to arrive at the conclusion that the fossil fuel industry really needs to get its act together and to step up and to trend and to make it easier for us to make better choices that are, that are aligned to the science that we have to transition away from dirty energy. So then in that case, what can you do to get involved in existing, you know, new campaigns locally, nationwide campaigns, global campaigns that really put pressure on the industry? That's what we need. We need to put pressure on the private sector. We need to put pressure on countries to really implement and to hold these various pledges accountable that companies make, that countries make. We as a public need to put that pressure on, right? So I don't want, I'm not going to give the answer that a lot of people give like recycle more and use public transport. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that, that's great. That's building awareness that we need to engage better with the environment. We need to be better environmental stewards. We need to care. All of that is true. But what I really want your watchers, viewers to do is to talk about it, recognize who the real perpetrators are, put pressure on private sector and public sector to change the system, overhaul the system. And then vote. <laughs> That's one that everybody says that I'm I'm a hundred percent behind. We are so pathetic in our in coming out and voting on this issue, right? Mm-hmm. We care about so many different topics, but climate is still such a small sliver of, of of a candidate's platform, even those that are really strong green candidates. It's still it it doesn't hold a bulk of the reason that somebody has voted for or voted against. So make this a top issue that you are identifying the appropriate candidate on and then actually get out there and vote. 
in my world, it's uh, voting with the fork, which, you know, I'm also trying to, you know, change perceptions and be like, you can actually change things with the power of your fork. In terms from a behavioral scientist uh, point of view, you know, I've uh, watched and read a lot about planetary boundaries. And I think it's like, four or five out of the planetary boundaries that we're already, you know, surpassing. And some of them were, we haven't surpassed yet from your lens. Is there a proper definition of the point of no return? It's funny you say that also, because a a lot of scientists, especially my close friends and colleagues, we've been kind of contending with this because there's no point in terrifying people. This was the hot 2023 was the hottest year on record. Right. And you keep hearing this concept of, every year going forward will be the coldest summer of your life. So it's just going to get hotter from here on out. I'm not saying that's not true, but the tipping point isn't a one off year. It is sustained breaking records year after year after year. Mm. And so we have to, we have to see if every single year is going to be actually hotter than the previous year. And it is honestly time for that to not be the case Really good news is also 2023 emissions went down. Carbon emissions went down in the United Mm. States. And that's fantastic. The only other time carbon emissions went down was during COVID, right? Everybody just Mm. Mm -hmm. stopped Um, moving. Yeah, but it's showing we're getting there. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act passed by Biden is working and carbon emissions decreased. We're okay. So we're already locked into warming. It's in the pipeline from so many different factors that are already in play that will be that need to be decommissioned. I'm talking about factories that are going to be spewing dirty energy into the coming years, decades, we need to figure out how to turn those off. And then we will see an even faster decrease in carbon emissions and perhaps a steadying off of these hottest years on record. So it's hard to say, it's hard to say what the tipping point will be. We know that we know that there will be frequent and simultaneous impacts at the same time that will result in accelerating more impacts, right? So mm-hmm. a good example of this, you've been to Antarctica. I was in the Arctic. I'm actually jealous you went to Antarctica. I would totally. <laughs> That's like a so one- many people don't know this, but people think that there's penguins, like penguins <laughs> and polar bears are at North and South. And that's not true. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the coolest animal you saw in Antarctica? Oh, it's definitely the king penguin. Yeah. Definitely the king penguin, you know, to be able to be that close and have them just honestly come up to like four feet high and walk around like humans and not be, you know, deterred by you because it's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, the movie, I don't know what your reaction was the first time when, when watching Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. but it's this like all inspiring, you know, yeah. moment of seeing what would happen you know, to a piece of land or an area if humans never touched it. And that's how I felt, you know, when we, you know, I think it was one of the, I think it was like the Falkland Islands that we arrived to. And it was just, just awe-inspiring. And just penguins are just like, you know, tens of thousands, you know, just walking around. It, yes, it, it's that. That's super, cool. <laughs> that's super cool. So the coolest animals I saw were whales, like so many whales and different kinds yeah. of whales and just they're just so happy. <laughs> They're so happy. Yeah, 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 so definitely. Happy. I would love to see a blue whale in the fe- in in my lifetime, so. And so the tipping point for me would be seeing these glaciers melting, right? So that's what you saw yeah. in Antarctica, you saw the ice sheets retreating. I saw the same thing in the Arctic and you can I mean, it's just it's it's insane how much we are dependent on these frozen parts of our planet in maintaining what we have established as as society today. And so if we continue to warm the planet and you have warming oceans that are then warming ice sheets and glaciers resulting in further retreat of glaciers and further calving of of ice sheets, now you are just, it's creating this feedback loop where warming is beginning more warming, right? Mm -hmm. So that to me is a massive tipping point because that there's just no way to refreeze ice, right? I mean, there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle but there's some incredible companies, right, that are that are very innovative, that are looking to refreeze ice and whatnot. And, and you can trade, you can buy all of that on the carbon markets. But if you see the vastness of yeah. how much <laughs> is frozen versus how quickly we're refreezing it, I mean, 
it doesn't yeah this is like a whole nother episode it's like you know you have ice sheets you know which you know help to reflect you know the the radiation of the of the sun and then if you have less of that then you have less to you know redirect the energy right and then it's just a, anyway it's a vicious cycle i'm also a scuba diver so you know for me to see you know, coral reefs bleaching and, you know, the, the process of ocean acidification. It's uh, for me, that's how I made the connect, yeah. you know, uh, and to bridge the gap. Let's talk about, you know, looking at time. Let's talk about your company. Uh, what is your company? We don't have time about. And what do you hope, what would you like to be achieved in three to five years from it? Is everything I've been saying about making climate mainstream conversation. That is essentially what the point of my company is. We are trying to make climate content interesting and engaging and relevant and at top of mind for people. Because what we know from communication science and behavioral science is the more something is top of mind, the more visible, the more tangible, the more immediate, the more likely we are to act on it and to get policy to act on it, to identify solutions, to solve the risk, to solve the threats that come from the planet warming. And then to really get policymakers to put forward the different regulations, different legislation that's required to get these solutions to commercial viability. So for me, solving my contribution to solving climate is through communication, is through media, is through bringing in cool different voices that you wouldn't expect to talk about this, but that people love. People love athletes. People mm -hmm. love entertainers. People love Taylor Swift, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. so if we can get these these voices to start talking about climate, then we are now reaching audiences in unexpected ways. Maybe they're they're listening to somebody like a LeBron James or like a Taylor Swift because they're fans of their, their sport or their music, but then they're learning and hearing about climate. So the point of my company is to bring in trusted spokespeople. I don't have Taylor Swift yet. I'm working on it, but like Jane Fonda, for example, I'm interviewing Jane Fonda at South by Southwest for the featured session for 2024. I'm very excited about that. And just uh, bringing in those trusted spokespeople that already are in people's living rooms, that people are already aware of, that people already know, and getting them to really discuss and make the case for acting on climate. And so that is the point of we don't have time, is we, we are using communication science, behavioral science to move audiences to action. For me, success would be really having climate top of mind, again, the way sports and politics and yeah. pop culture is, because that means we're, we've done something. That means we are in the cultural zeitgeist. That means that mm. everyone is talking about it. That means that everybody is highly focused on how to overcome it. And when we get all hands on deck from like the young person in the middle of America who wants to be an artist to, you know, the, um, to the, to the head of a major polluting country like India, and get everybody doing their part and contributing, then we're going to be really accelerating our solutions. And I believe we can do that. We've overcome harder problems in the past. This is not beyond our scope of solving. Humans are incredibly ingenious. We have built buildings in the middle of oceans. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> we're talking about... We're talking yeah, you have civilian space travel now, right? So. <laughs> we, can, we can solve this. We have the technology. We have the ingenuity. We have the technology. There's no reason we can't solve this. So to me, it's a communications challenge, right? It's really getting people to care and it's really getting the policy to get behind it. For we don't have time, please join it. It's free. It's totally free for individuals and for nonprofits. It's a platform that you can immediately come in, connect, immediately connected to other individuals, other companies, other organizations around the world. And we really bring people into the fold of what can I do answering that question? What can I do? Well, what do you care? What, what, what part of this is most interesting for you? Is it fashion? Is it transportation? Is it food? And then based on that, what, or is it conservation? Is it something more local to you that you really care about? Based on that, we connect and we help amplify solutions and efforts. You don't have to go and it's expensive to go. And it's, it's actually pretty ridiculous to go to some of these conferences where this stuff is being talked about. Right. I just came back from COP 28, which was in Dubai. That's not accessible for so no. many people who want to be working on climate to physically go and to be part of this UN conference and part mm -hmm. of the UN negotiations to solve climate. But my company, we don't have time. We'll plug you in. It, it's like you're there. It's a virtual mm -hmm. platform where you can talk to one another, where you can engage, where you can hold those making decisions accountable and yeah. ask them to do the right thing. 
Yeah, yeah. And you're absolutely right. It's really about bringing these high level conversations, you know, to us, right? I'm not high level as in it's far reaching, but high level that it's, you know, kind of, you can't really access it, right? So I'm glad that you're, you know, in a way your company, you know, becomes like a middleman, you know, in terms of, you know, bringing uh, that type of news and conversation to us and to make it closer and to be part of, like you said, part of that culture as I guys. Dr. Sweta, thank you so, so much, you know, for coming on to the conversation and, you know, thank you for, you know, that persistent and consistent energy and dedication that you bring, you know, because you're all over the, the media and, uh, you know, it's, it's that consistency, right? And we're human beings, right? We, you know, in my world, you know, we talk a lot about burnout. We talk about emotional wellness and resiliency. So, you know, for me to be able to see that energy and dedication that you put into every single, you know, format that you're in is definitely really, really needed. So I really thank you for your time and dedication. It's so my pleasure. And it's so important you're doing this. You're creating this conversations and you're pushing it out. I mean, this is absolutely critical. It very much aligns to <laughs> behavioral scientists advocacy for communicating. So appreciate you too. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Guys, thank you so much for watching another episode. If you like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you thought that this was a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And until the next time, please say goodbye to Dr. Swetha. <laughs> hey guys, we hope you enjoy that episode. If you like that, please like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, and anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. And if you felt that this was a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And also remember that the first five seasons, 150 episodes, now can be seen and heard on our new The Chef Doc app. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating and we greatly appreciate it. So, and we'll see you on the next one.